Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle with Brian Grady, editor of Pro Farmer. A mixed trade in the grains on Friday after uh, we had a long week of the Pro Farmer crop tour. We had estimates out at 1.30 after the markets closed and corn was lower, soybeans higher. But Brian, let's talk a little bit about the soybean number, a monster number you guys pulled out. Yeah, so on the production, 4.74 billion bushels on a national yield of 54.9 bushels per acre. Uh, the amount of potting out there uh, on the soybeans is unbelievable across the seven states. And, and uh, you know, the only state that that had a, a downturn in, in pod counts versus year ago was Ohio. And the Ohio soybean crop is really good. And so... I, you know, it, it just gives you a, an indication of, of just how many pods are out there. But the other factor is our soil moisture ratings. And that's something that we track in each field that we pull samples from. They were up and up significantly. So the crop not only has a lot of pods, but it has a lot of moisture to finish. And, and uh, this could be an absolute just monster crop. And, and uh, that's why we put the, uh, the production and yield as high as possible, unless we have some sort of uh, weather event that uh, derails the crop, it's well on its way to a record. Yeah, that's a good point that you bring up. What about in some of those northern areas, northern Iowa, up into southern Minnesota, where they've got two or three different crop stages? Is there possibility of immature beans being hit by early frost? Well, an early frost definitely would hurt, uh, no doubt about that. That would, that would rob the uh, crop of some of its uh, record yield potential. I, th I think it still could uh, be a record with an early frost, but it wouldn't be as big as what uh, we would have if it's a normal or a late frost. So uh, that would be uh, one of the issues that uh, could potentially derail. But with that said, I don't think that's in the, the extended forecast. I'm not a weather forecaster, but uh, the weather forecasts I've seen call for mostly above normal temperatures. Yeah, I know you said on the tour, soybeans really stole the show. Your production number was 151 million bushels above USDA's uh, last estimate in August. And so what does this mean for inning stocks? How much does it put us above 600 million in your opinion? Oh, you know, so you're adding two ending stocks at, you know, for certain, um, probably above 600 million. And, and at some point you get to it where it doesn't have much of a price impact anymore because it's already baked into the market. Too much is too much. And, and we've already gotten to that level. So now we're just adding on to too much. And, and what it probably means is longer term, uh, we have to get rid of that supply. So we have to get to a price that's low enough to encourage demand. Obviously, China's the number one consumer. We know that China booked a lot of Brazilian soybeans um, into the fall time period. And, and so we really need to have strong exports from September to January, which is typically the U.S.'s strongest export period. And, and so there is some uncertainty there. We've seen some daily sales start to, to come in from China and unknown destinations, but we need those to be bigger and more consistent. Yeah. Talk about corn and where you came out with yield and production there. Yeah, so our production number, uh, just a little bit below 15 billion bushels at 14.979 billion bushels, national average yield of 181.1 bushels per acre. So uh, down from where USDA was with its August estimates, we just don't feel like the crop is quite as big. It, it's going to be a record in all likelihood unless it's derailed, uh, like I said, uh, by a weather event. And, and so um, it's just a matter of how big and uh, how many bushels we put in the bin at this point in time. But the, the crop has moisture to finish. Uh, the conditions are relatively mild at, at the moment. And, and uh, so we're at it. But the, the corn crop has done a lot of work up until this point. Uh, it doesn't have as much work to do on the back end. And that isn't always the case in, in some years. Going back, talking a little bit about the corn number, you came in with lower national estimate, despite the fact that on the crop tour, you had record corn yields and production, or at least yields out of both Illinois and Iowa, the two heavy hitters. Absolutely. Uh, and we are projecting records in, in both of those states. Uh, we just don't feel like the Illinois corn crop is the 225 that USDA put on it as of August 1. Um, it's close. We put it at 220. We put Iowa at 212. Uh, we put Indiana at uh, 210. And, and so the I states are really carrying it. And, and typically when you're talking about a record yield or near record production, you're talking about uh, the fringe areas having to help out. And a lot of the fringe areas are hurt this year. 
but the big heavy producers, uh, the heavy yielding states uh, in the central corn belt are really carrying a lot of weight this year. The heavy hitters are, are coming up with the bases loaded. And uh, in, in that type of situation for baseball terminology, you can put a lot of runs on the board, uh, meaning it in the production side of things, you can put a lot of bushels on the board. Yeah. Corn, you were down two bushels on yield from where USDA was, production down 168 million bushels. Again, what does that mean for inning stocks? Does it get us below 2 billion? Yeah, I, I do. I think that would pull the ending stocks below 2 billion bushels. And that's more psychological than anything. We're still working with a, a plentiful supply on the corn side. Uh, but psychologically, that may help us put in some sort of a, a harvest time low and then start to work gradually higher. But for that to happen, money flow is important and the funds have to start covering some of their massive short position. And uh, the other thing is that while soybeans may pull down, corn's gonna have to pull up. And so you have a tug of war between the two major markets and, and we'll see which one uh, wins out. And, and it'll probably be money flow that is the determining factor there. Even if we get a smaller corn crop, is that enough to get the funds to cover this massive or near record short position that they have, or what would it take? Well, I guess we'll see. Uh, you never know what the funds and the money flow. They, they seem to have a herd mentality where they all move in one direction. Um, and we've seen them, you know, with, with the price impact, uh, you know, uh, hurting money into the short side of the market and, and the negative price impact there. So if we do get them to start covering shorts, um, you know, then maybe we can move up. The worst case scenario is you get a flat market and the funds cover shorts and, and prices don't increase. And, and, you know, in that scenario, uh, then there can be a pause and, and then they can re-add shorts later and, and you, you put more price pressure on the market. Is it possible this could help put in an early harvest low in corn though? It is, uh, you know, like, like I said, on soybeans, farmers hold a lot of corn uh, of old crop on farm still. And uh, they got a big new crop supply coming, even though we don't think it's quite as big as what USDA estimated as of August 1. And, and so um, a lot of competition and a lot of farmer selling on the move up, and that probably restricts rally attempts. So we're coming into the last week of August. You mentioned all the old crop supplies. We're going to go into delivery period. Lots of old crop out there, but a lot of basis fixed contracts that either have to be rolled or priced. What do you expect? Is that going to really weigh on the market next week? On well, corn? it's not, not positive. I can tell you that. Uh, um, you know, that anytime that uh, you have those type of scenarios, it, it tends to tamp out any kind of uh, rally attempt. And we know that there's going to be a lot of farmer selling of, of still of old crop. We got a big new crop supply coming, and uh, so rally attempts are going to be really. Um, probably a struggle and, and uh, you know, may take a couple starts and stops moving to the upside to, to gain any kind of momentum. Yeah. The other interesting thing will be what USDA gets out of September's WASD numbers when they actually get in the field, right? Right. Uh, USDA will do their first uh, objective yield surveys starting in September uh, and then repeat it again in October and November and, and then uh, ahead of the final. So, They'll start to peel off uh, um, the, the actual yield samples from the fields. And uh, when it's harvestable, they'll send it in, weigh it and all that type of stuff and, and go through their normal procedure. So uh, that will be added to the farmer survey that generated the August crop estimates. From yeah. And corn probably got drugged down by wheat today. But we, despite the fact that we averted the Canadian rail strike, um, had more new contract lows here today. Where does the pressure keep coming for that market? Well, there's just no conviction behind the buying because uh, there isn't a whole lot of export demand and, and the Black Sea region continues to dominate that, um, selling cheaper wheat onto the world market. Uh, and when you can't generate much export demand, it's really hard to, to encourage buyer interest, especially when, when you got the corn and soybean markets that are struggling. And, and so just as a whole, and you know, we've been just talking about the ag markets, but across the 20 raw commodities, uh, funds are record net short at the moment. So uh, it's a commodity issue as much as it is an ag issue at this point in time. All right. Thanks as always, Brian Grady with Pro Farmer. That is Markets Now.